Okay, I'm recording. So today I'm back at my university, Chapman University, observing my office hour during this class. So I don't think it would be good for me to give my presentation uh, live. So I'm recording it ahead of time Sunday evening. So to begin that, Okay, so what I'm going to address today in our class on women and witchcraft is the motif of witchcraft in the works of the author Neil Gaiman. And here you get my bona fides, uh, my different universities, and the one email that anyone can re reach me at. So. Let me just observe that uh, on the one hand, I do think that uh, it is a step forward that we now are allowed to address pop culture and academe. But on the other hand, I think sometimes people push that a little too far. Sometimes pop culture, well, as uh, Robert Silverberg once said, 90% of almost everything, anything is crap. So. If we're going to talk about pop culture, I think we need to address first why a given uh, example of pop culture is relevant or significant or worthy of consideration in the context of academic. So, for example, Neil Gaiman, who is he and why is he significant? Well, he is an English novelist, but he got his start writing comic books. He was born in 1960. Here's a picture of him. And he has won multiple awards. Things like the Hugo, the Nebula, the Bram Stoker for horror fiction, and Newbery and Carnegie, Carnegie medals for children's fiction. So, and when I looked it up, he's also been uh, awarded a number of other prizes or rewards. Now, what makes him interesting from an academic perspective? Well, his primary inspiration source is literature itself. He's very well read. His writings encompass both serious literature and pop culture. They're elusive, they're intertextual. So you, there's a lot to be mined here because he's always riffing off of other sources. But I would also add, he's not merely derivative. It's not this rather inane game of look at what a subtle illusion I've made because his works always work on, on their own merits, whether or not you know what the sources are. Also, so he, also you will often com combine a number of different sources that he's working on, and he will often set out to subvert those sources. So for example, one of his more famous stories is I Cthulhu, which is a Lovecraft horror story told from the perspective of Cthulhu, the monster. Um, a study in Emerald, really fascinating, available for free download, Cthulhu meets Sherlock Holmes. The case of the four and 20 blackbirds is a hard-boiled detective story where the hard-boiled detective is interviewing fairy tale people. Snow, glass, apples. I think this is one of the most intriguing ones and relevant to the theme of our class. In this story, Snow White is Snow White because she's a vampire. The evil queen is a witch, but she's campaigning against Snow White because she's trying to preserve her kingdom. So he takes established tropes, but he often undermines or subverts them or reinterprets them. So let me give you an example of how he examines witchcraft in his stories and what standard tropes he buys into. Now, we haven't talked in this class so far about the notion of the tripartite goddess, which is to say um, the goddess Hecate in amongst the ancient Greeks, sometimes referred to as she was three, the maiden, uh, maiden, matron, and crone. But also we have the motifs of the Greek understanding of the witch, the Roman understanding of the witch, the wise woman witch, and finally, uh, the notion of 
a devil worshiping witch or the kind of witches that were being attacked at so called during the witch trials. So I think we can find all five of these themes in one or another of these stories. So, for example, one of his made more popular stories was actually made into the movie, it was called Stardust. And there's a character called Lamia, and she's one of three crones. You can see her in the middle of that, played by Michelle Pfeiffer. But in the course of the story, she's the major antagonist. She gets her other two um, companions to give her some of their magic so she can restore her youth temporarily in order to pursue a quest that will result in the death of one of the, protag of the protagonists of the story, but will restore their uh, the health and beauty and you all three of them. At which point she becomes more the Greek understanding of the witch, beautiful, but also intimidating and to be feared. He's, one of his major works was The Sandman. It was a series of comic books. And one of his major motifs was the notion of she who is three, which is to say he's with on Hecate, the tripartite goddess, maiden, matron, and crone. Here portrayed in the TV series, but also found in a comic book series. Um, so in the Sandman, uh, the uh, motif is the goddess of witches who are three persons in one person. Yeah. Um, the ancient Greeks came up with that concept long, long before Christianity. A third one, which was a collaboration that he wrote with the novelist Terry Pratchett, who I will be talking about in my next uh, presentation. Um, he wrote a novel with Terry Pratchett called Good Omens. And then one of the pivotal characters in Good Omens is Agnes Nutter. Now, the novel plays very amusingly with the concept of pre- destination. Agnes Nutter is an actual prophet. She anticipates the future. In fact, she goes so far as to anticipate when she's going to be burned at the stake as the last witch executed in England. And she does that. She hides some um, gunpowder and nails under her skirt. So when they put her on the stake to burn her to death, she also takes down all the people that are setting out to do so. Um, also, she's portrayed as being the uh, uh, kind of a midwife and a healer. My kind of woman. Finally, uh, one last one, and actually my favorite. This is the character of Thessaly. She also appears in Sandman uh, in a volume called Game of You. And also, she was spun off into her own Mini series called The Sandman Presents the Thessalia. And she is portrayed as being a Greek witch from the area of Thessaly, hence her name. But she is not uh, necessarily an antag antagonist. Uh, she doesn't go reach out and engage with other people unless. Someone comes after her or those that she cares for. So, John Wick, meet your competitor. So, we find then in one or another of the ways that he addresses witchcraft in his story, we find all five of these major archetypes are uh, being played with and often subverted. So, what can we conclude from this? Um, well, his work is a reflection or reflection on narrative and mythic motifs, both literary and contemporary pop culture. And I like the way that he configures and plays the one against the other. He almost always combines influences from numerous sources. He has a very popular blog and he will have often admits publicly what his sources are and encourages people to look them up. 
and he usually provides a distinctive reflection or spin on the material. I like the fact that he will take of a mythic motif, but then he will often undermine or subvert it. And with the possible exception of the Lamia that I mentioned, uh, most of his characters are essentially feminist. Yeah, the, uh, in She Who's Three in the Samad, they are protagonists. In Good Omens, uh, Agnes Nutter and those who are her descendants are people that move forward the story of the novel as a whole. Um, Thusly, she doesn't want to be a hero. She would rather not be a hero, but if she's put in the corner, she will be heroic. The one that is perhaps a bit questionable is the Lamia, but here's the thing, in the movie version, she's portrayed as an out and out villain. But in the novel, it's a bit more ambiguous. She doesn't really want to take human life, but she also wants to preserve her life and the life of her two friends. So is that, does that make her evil or merely utilitarian? So I think his stories are well worth reading and engaging with and reflecting upon. They are primarily entertainments, but he draws enough from the good stuff, from good, serious literature and um, creates interesting um, twists or reinterpretations on that literature. Also, these stories work as stories unto themselves. You don't have to read the original sources to enjoy the stories. But if you do, you will get more of what he's trying to do. So, there's my presentation, my recommendation, Neil Gaiman. He's the good stuff. We will now return to class.